Paul Mensa's Wall of Power TV is brought to you in part by Two Gingers Irish Whiskey Grey Wolf Lodge, your home away from home in the North Woods and the Solar Arts Building in Northeast Minneapolis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metzen. Tonight, we are going to be celebrating the life and legacy of one of Minneapolis's greatest musicians, Mr. Willie Murphy, who passed away on January 13th. Murphy was really the heart and soul of the Minneapolis music scene for over 50 years. He was a musician who could play from folk to funk, he was a bassist, a guitarist, a piano player, a songwriter, a ranger, producer, band leader, vocalist, recording artist, and a philosopher king. His record, Run and Jump and Stand and Still, that he recorded with Spider John Kerner, was released in 1969 on Electra Records and brought John and Willie some more national acclaim. One publication called it a rag psychedelic ragtime record. Willie went on to produce Bonnie Raitt's first record for Warner Brothers in 1971, about a year after he started the legendary Minneapolis R&B band, Willie and the Bumblebees. We have two gentlemen, two of the best musicians in town, I'm honored to say are both friends of mine <clears throat> that go way back with Mr. Willie Murphy. The first we're going to chat with is my friend Willie Walker, the most nominated man in the history of the Blues <laughs> Foundation Blues Awards. He's up for Soul Blues Singer in 2019. Those awards are in Memphis and May. If you want to make a fun trip to a great show, he's been playing with Willie since the six, early to mid-60s. Maurice J. Cox, saxophone player for Willie and the Bumblebees, has been with Willie since the late 60s. Willie Walker, you've known Murphy the longest, right? Of just about anybody I know since 1959. You played with them, you hung out with them, and I'm sure you argued with them over the years. No. Really? No. Great. We disagreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I disagreed. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he had his own idea about certain materials and how he thought this would go and you know and I just plain old say I'm, we were a lot alike in many ways right if I didn't like it I didn't like it right if he didn't like it he didn't like it right you know and I just say no you sang it yourself right I don't I, I don't like the way this is going I don't like the harmonies I don't like anything about it <laughs> and you know he, you, that red hair, and you know, you, you, <laughs> you can see him, the face getting red, and, <laughs> and he wanting to say something really, really bad. And right. but uh, neither one, we never had those moments. You know, okay. it was like, hey, I got a right to disagree. I don't like it. Right. And right. If, if I brought something up and he didn't like it, it was the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I think it should go this way. You know, right. it, it, that's just the person he was. When he finally, you, you knew him first as a bass player. He became, you know, he's still one of my all-time favorite electric bass players ever. Uh, that K bass. Yeah, yeah. that old K, old K bass. Just like that old Jimmy Reed guitar was a K. I mean, it was just that same look, yeah. Um, then he became, I don't know exactly what order. Uh, I imagine he probably always played a little piano at Honestly. some point. And then a, a guitar player, not only a... Great strummer, but a, a great soloist. But Willie Walker, when Murphy started to get into his own as a singer, when did you really start to hear it? You know what? And this goes back to what Maurice was talking about earlier. Because, I mean, actually, when Murphy and I were getting together, that was during that period when there were no mixed groups, period. Right. But, I mean, we had... The black drummer, his name is Bruce Scroggin, and myself, you know, and we really should have stuck together, in my in my opinion. Okay, you, you know, and uh, I made him. I might have might have made a move too soon, like mm -hmm. like never make a move too soon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might have made a move too soon because 
Uh, it's difficult to recognize genius. And Murphy had genius. And to see and try to understand <clears throat> what he was trying to interpret was a little difficult because, I mean, I grew up on simple things. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm then, just give me a simple song and let me sing it. Right. You know. Right. But, I mean, Murphy was a little intricate. Music was always complex. <laughs> yeah. There, was no, there were no simple Murphy No, songs. no. Right. Maurice, do you remember going over to, <clears throat> well, I'm sure you do. Willie had that great house on the West Bank that oh, yeah. must have been built like 1890. Oh, yeah. Down from Cullis Tavern. In fact, uh, Cullis. You, yeah. yeah, you were around when Cullis. Oh, yeah, it was 1970. Was three, three, sure. two. Three, three, two. two. People don't even remember three, two no, anymore. No, not many people remember you know? that. But, uh, and of course, you know, the stories about Bob Dylan going over there when Bob was hanging out in Minnesota in the summer of 82 yeah. just to listen to Willie's records. Did... Uh, and I saw a great picture that somebody posted this morning on Facebook of Willie going through his stack of records. Yeah, and I, yeah. I've been over his house enough to uh, see those. I Remember what, what Willie was listening to back then? Did you ever go just hang out and listen Actually, and have a few beers or whatever um, you were doing? Murphy turned me on to blues. I wasn't a blues guy. I was a jazz guy. I wasn't really that much interested in blues, j jazz and R&B. And he just kept hammering these old blues albums. I'm like, oh man. And I started listening to more and more of it. And then I'm like, okay, okay. Huh? And I started getting more into it, and Murphy and Dave Ray are the ones that actually talked me into listening to country music, which hmm. was funny because I uh, got to be good friends with Waylon Jennings <laughs> <laughs> so, through, through all of that. You but, did? Yeah. Well, let's hear about the hat. Well, <laughs> our bands were stuck in a hotel, a motel in Iowa in a blizzard. And we're, it's, it's Willie and the Bees and Waylon Jennings and Gordon Lightfoot. Wow. And so we all decided to hang out and party a little bit. And Gordon had gone to bed. That sounds like my dream party, actually. Gordon and his wife had gone to bed. And it was Waylon, uh, their bass player back then, a guy named Duke Goff. And... Uh, rhythm guitar player Curtis Buck and we all started hanging and drinking then guitars came out people started singing and people were scattered around this big room and then we hear from the other side of the room oh Curtis don't you be going and shooting nobody again <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're going again <laughs> again <laughs> and we look over and Boyle Harris our trumpet player who was 
Tennessee pecker wood. I'm sorry. Right. There's no other way around it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a t hard time even liking him. Right. And boy, was could be pretty obnoxious. So what he ended up doing was getting in some argument with Waylon's rhythm guitar player, and he was actually going to shoot him. <laughs> he was going to shoot Boyle. <laughs> so we broke them up, had a great time, drank all the rest of the night, and from then on, Waylon would send me backstage passes when nice. he come to town. And I'd go and hang out with him at their new bus and stuff like that. But that's how we met. That's fantastic. In City. You know, um, Dave Ray, who I got to be very good friends with, and uh, a lot of my guitar style is actually uh, patterned after when he used to play solo at the Artist Quarter sure. on Sunday nights. Those single line yep. solos, almost Ornette Coleman-esque on that old Birdland. And I thought, geez, a guy can actually solo a single string with kind of a blues folk style. Oh, Dave, yeah. And, uh, but a guy named, or did, you must have knew uh, or know Arnie Broger. Yeah. Yeah, and a great talent scout did the uh, Memphis Blues Caravan. He went to uh, high school with Dave Ray, and D this is like 57, 58. Dave had one of Johnny Cash's, uh, uh, Johnny Cash record uh -huh. as a junior or senior in high school in wow. the late 50s. He said, first guy in high school that was in a Johnny Cash. Huh. So, uh, and I had uh, Hit Murphy on my radio show. I dug it up. I'm playing it. Uh, going to play it on the Wall of Power Radio Hour. And he talks about, at, 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 when he's sitting around with the guitar, he's a folk and country guy. You know? Yeah. When he's with the band or, or, or on the piano, it's a different thing. Yeah. But the guy was, uh, he played all styles, basically. Yeah. yeah. Dave, well, Dave Ray, uh, he was a great 12-string player until he had a motorcycle accident. And I, am, I remember the night it happened. Uh, hmm. He was riding down Cedar Avenue, and it was right after the, after the uh, bridge by the U. Mm -hmm. And the bridge had just been finished, and he wiped out on his BMW motorcycle and fractured his arm. Wow. And they wired it back together again, but he could, he could never again play 12 strings. Never, never quite had the strength, yeah. right? Yeah. That you needed. Yeah. No, he couldn't strum, too. Mm. He also couldn't strum. Wow. So, uh, so that's what he was doing, and toward, toward the end of his life, he started playing 12 string again, and then in the last few years of his life, he discovered jazz. Yeah. <laughs> what happened is he learned how to read. And David never ridden, right? And written. and so he was—he's one of those blues guys that puts the change in wherever you want to put the change. Right, right, right. Just right. Play, ah, I'm playing bass. Thirteen bars, what the heck? Yeah. You know. So what he ended up doing was he learned to read a chart, and it's like a whole new world for him. Right. And so he started reading charts and playing, and that's when he wanted to play jazz and swing and yeah. stuff. And it's like one of my greatest Willie Murphy, Dave Ray story. I had taken over in September of 2001 uh, a blues club that was featured barbecue and blues. And I was going to do a show with some of the top blues uh, players in town that for some reason or another weren't playing that place. So I had the Butanes, Dave Ray, uh, Willie Murphy, I mean, I even had you there, uh, Willie Walker. And the place was packed. I was making great money. Uh -huh. And so 9-11 happened. So we turned it in for the new sheriff in town book in this place to a 9-11 benefit. Wow. Some New York firemen were in town. <clears throat> so they came in and we gave all the proceeds to them. Cool. But the pressure was on for Metza because the guy whose the club was named after was there, all the corporate muckety mucks. Then my new blues buddies came in. Willie Murphy opened the show. It was five o'clock. Solo piano, which was for me Kills. my favorite. Kills. Willie Murphy was mm -hmm. solo piano. Kills. Oh, he killed, but before he started, the room quiets down. Willie plays on his um, piano. The first, th and I'm sitting right next to Dave Ray, and the first thing Willie says, they call this a blues club? It's not even a freaking restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Dave, that was Murphy. <laughs> Dave Ray looks over at me and says, that's Murphy working on his book back. <laughs> 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 we'll be back with Willie Walker and Maurice Jaycox on Wall of Power TV. Stick around. We'll save your seat. My next guests, Willie and the Bees, have been part of the Twin Cities music scene almost as long as there's been a Twin Cities music scene. Led by one of Minnesota's most endearing and respected musicians, Willie Murphy, their music is always innovative and exciting, like the song that we've got for you tonight. This is a song that we taped last fall, and it's soon to be released as their new single. It's called Supermarket. In the world of money, the rich man is king. You ain't got you ain't no got it, you don't like it. it. I'm gonna tell you something that's an unnatural fact. The whole world's a store with the bobbins in the back. Your life, uh huh. Your dreams, uh huh. Your labor, uh huh. Your hopes and schemes, uh huh. Your sickness, uh huh. Your health, uh huh. Your sanity, your vanity, your wealth. What's one of your favorite Murphy stories, Mr. Walker? One of my favorites happened at Chris Moon Studio. Okay. And Where Prince got his start. Yeah. And uh, Murphy was working with Chris, and I just happened to be there working on a song I just recorded late, lately called Hey, Take a Holiday with my brother-in-law. And Murphy was saying, I should play that damn song. I mean, you, you, these guys, you got them, you can't play. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and you know what? I wish he could have. Right. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish he could have. But I mean, that would that, that would have been a reconnection, right? With the, between the two of us. Did you ever have a chance then over the years to record together? No. Boy, was that. No, you know, as a matter of fact, I was telling Maurice. I mean, M Murphy gave me a song called "Faith, Hope, and Charity." that he wanted me to record, but I understand my recent Murphy has done it since. Yeah. But I mean, when he gave it to me, I was so busy, I never had time right. to just sit down and listen and, and learn it. And uh, I regret that now. Faith, hope, and charity, that, that is a great, um, great way to think about Murphy. Yeah. You know, he was, uh, I saw a letter to the editor today in the Star Tribune by, uh, my friend Larry Long, 
and he said, you know, Willie had been sailing sober for 35, 40, 40, years. 40 years. And his only vice was music. Mm -hmm. Well, and cigars. And cigars, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And cigars. <laughs> In fact, there was a guy, I bumped into him at Center Supermarket, Willie brought his, you know, he had that little 24 track, well, little, it was a big 24 track recorder in his house. But Willie liked his cigars and he took it in, just uh, all these channels stopped working and he took it into this guy, just happened to be standing next to it at the checkout line. He goes, Willie brought his uh, 24 track into me yeah. to, to be cleaned and fixed. Yeah. He goes, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. <laughs> When I went to Murphy's so house, cigarette and he, he introduced yeah. me to the songs, right. I mean, I was amazed because I'm sitting there looking around, and I, I just burned out. I said, I said, why aren't you dead already? <laughs> and I mean, he, he's like, what? I said, look at all these burns. And, 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 and I said, everything is burned up from <laughs> I mean, the Should have burned a lot. <laughs> I mean, even, even the clothes he had on, he had cigarette, but, uh, cigar, cigar burns. burns. And, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I wrote in a bit for him last night and that I'm going to uh, pitch to a couple of publications. And one thing that we all remember was very rarely that his head of hair ever saw a brush or a comb. Oh, hardly ever. <laughs> you know, yeah. hardly ever. Saw his fingers. Yeah. That's it. And, uh, and he did have a nice array of about a half a dozen to a dozen suit coats. I doubt any of them ever saw went to the dry cleaner. Uh, probably not. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure he knew what a dry cleaner was. It, right. Well, he was. But my point was, I'm not dismissing him at all. But he was so involved. Every time I talked to Willie, whether it was on the phone at his house, bumped into him in a bar or on the street, he was always talking about the project oh, yeah. he was working on or the next project. It was pretty much music 24-7. He was obsessed. Everything else was just stuff he did when he wasn't playing or, right. or, or writing a song or right. something like that. I went out for lunch with him with Dan Lund. I forget who else was there. And he was a vegetarian for years. This guy was the king of tofu. Yeah, well. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, he was suggesting what I should try. I go, I'm still eating meat. But, uh, but the conversations with Willie, as I said in the opening, he was a philosopher king as well. Oh, yeah. oh, he yeah. could chat about really anything. Well read, extremely well read, constant, constantly reading. Constantly but. reading, never had a television in his house. No. And as we know, very opinionated. No. <laughs> <laughs> and an avowed Marxist. Opinionated? <sighs> and an avowed Marxist. God bless him. Now, you've worked with them since 1970, Maurice Jaycox. When you look back at Willie Murphy, the man and the musician and the composer, besides being what you said earlier about one of America's greatest songwriters. Who do you think he was at his core? Because he, he, he seemed to be at times, he could be very gruff and very short with people, but he was actually, and, which was not unlike Dave Ray, but one of the sweetest cats he ever met oh, yeah. too. Oh yeah, and sometimes people with the biggest heart and who feel the most uh, fight that as hard right. as they can and even in the worst periods of his life when he was drinking, and he could still sit down and write these beautiful songs. And let's face it, a lot of his life, he, was the, he wasn't exactly kind to people. Mm -hmm. He didn't suffer fools lightly. Right. And he had harsh words for just about everybody <laughs> he knew. I mean, everybody had been stung by things he had said. But somehow this disagreeable person that he would become could write all this beauty. I mean, right. breathtaking songs and the insights into his songs and the way he was thinking. He was genuine. Every song he was eccentric, he had, and he was honest. Every song, he, every song told a story. Every song, uh, there was a simple lyric. 
even when he wrote a bubblegum song, it was a fantastic bubblegum song that right. told a story, uh, Love Buzz, yeah. just a little bubblegum song. And he made it, and the words all fit together. The verses of his songs always tell a story. There's a beginning and an end, and it's, uh, they're fun to listen to. Well, and at the end of the day, Willie just wanted a better world. Oh, truly, right? truly. Truly, a philosopher, a poet, yeah. I think at heart. And a street cat, total heart, street heart, cat. But a poet, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the words that he wrote and uh, so many of the lyrics that he wrote were just breathtaking. You read them and just, wow, man. And um, I love songs, I mean, uh, for our second album, the Out of the Woods album, I knew all, all the songs because they were like, I just want to know these songs, I mean, beautiful songs. I had the uh, pleasure, you know, when I moved to town, right, 78, I mean, Willie was like, there was Colonel Rand Glover yeah. and Willie Murphy, and I was pretty much, I, I bowed down, I still do, you know. But it was like, you were intimidated. You know, I was intimidated by Willie Murphy, and, and kind of intimidated still almost to the end. But we became very good friends on the level that, that we were. And we had a mutual respect. So I was doing my first record in 84 called Paper Tigers, and I had this tune called Robots on Death Row. And I said, hell, I'm going to reach out to Willie and see if he'd want to play piano on it. So, and I had a few bucks, and of course, you, <laughs> Willie you always needed a few bucks. Um, but he wouldn't have played on it just for the money. So I went to his studio at his house, and he laid down this beer house piano. We cut this thing in one take. And then he said, let me throw some bass on. I go, Willie Murphy playing bass on one way to He goes, let me throw some harmony vocal on. Oh, yeah. And I'm going, and then we got Timmy O'Keefe to come in my own, yep. mm -hmm. my running buddy who turned me yes. on to the blues, who is also a huge Willie Murphy fan to come in and play harp. So I said, Willie, I said, do you, do you think this, you know, does it need drums? And he goes, here. And he added I'm letting the cat out of the bag here because nobody knows this. But the drums on there were electric drums yeah. on this barrel house blues okay. thing. And I said, well, how do you think it's going to sound, Willie, with the electric drums? He goes, don't worry. I'm going to program it to sound like a bit of a drunken blues drummer. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> People could listen to it. They'd never know no, it was electric no. drums. Part of the genius of Willie Murphy. Indeed. Willie Walker and Maurice J. Cox, I so appreciate you coming on the show tonight to talk about Willie Murphy. I'm going to start with Willie Walker, who's known the longest. How do you think Willie Murphy is going to be remembered, Mr. Walker? Well, you know what? I hope it continu continues from Sunday because I dedicated my show Sunday to Willie Murphy and his memory and the legacy that he's left. And Maurice, I was happy to have Maurice there to share it with me, you know, because we were there at the beginning. Right. Yeah. Reese, how do you think uh, Willie Murphy is going to be remembered over the years? I think that as more and more of his songs are recorded and distributed, people are going to re realize uh, just what a great talent he was and songwriter he was. I, he's, gonna, he's got songs that are songs that are going to be immortal. Right. You know, and that's pretty amazing. That is a perfect way to end this show. Basically, I think we all three agree, one of the most soulful white guys we ever met, and oh, a yeah. pure genius. Oh, yes. Without a <laughs> oh, doubt. Wow. Yeah. Long live the great <laughs> Willie Murphy. I want to thank Willie Walker tonight. Willie plays in town every now and then when he's not touring the world, as does Maurice J. Cox. Track these guys down. They sing like... Uh, uh, Two twin brothers, which they are <laughs> at their soul. Thanks for watching Wall of Power TV. We'll be back next week. I'm your host, Paul Metza. We'll save you a seat.